this is Pukeology Podcast, where science meets your hilarious puke stories and the tips and tricks to stop that up chuckle that you need. You never know what's going to spew out of her mouth. Here's my mama, Dr. Puke Nemo. So your uterus is just one organ group that will see lots of changes during your pregnancy. But my pregnant patients always ask me, how will my uterus actually change? And what type of uterus do I have? Can problems in pregnancy be as a result of my health and the health of the baby because of my uterus? Trust me, we'll get into all of those answers as your favorite pregnancy doctor. And not only that, but get into a lot more stuff about the uterus, which is your organ that changes the absolute most. All here today in Pregnancy Pathology Podcast, episode 84, How Does the Pregnant Uterus Change? Do you want no more morning sickness, pregnancy nausea, or how about no more headaches or migraines? Just visit our sponsor, nomonausea.com, the only natural way to instantly stop your worst, nausea, vomiting, or headaches now. And get 25% off with the code PUKE25. That's P-U-K-E-2-5. Or just place your Nomo Nausea ban on your registry at Bye Bye Baby. Or get it shipped for free in just two days on Amazon, where as a Prime vendor, you know that you're taken care of. Plus, the little ones too. Do you know we have a Nomo Nausea Kids and Nomo Sleepless Nights Kids? By the way, moms, the sleep one works for moms with small wrists too. Now available at your local Walmart store. Do you want to hear some pregnancy humor that may just make you want to pee your pants? Like you don't have to pee all the time anyway, with hilarious stories like airport face, highway blues, or freaky Friday. If you want to learn more about your pregnancy, humor and knowledge is the key to help you survive these nine months. And just know we're in this together. Today, you'll learn the science behind the parts of the uterus, what kind of uterus you have, how does the uterus function during pregnancy, and what uterine changes can be expected during pregnancy. All coming up right now, episode 84, Pregnant Uterus and Its Changes. The Science of Puke, Pukeology. So what does the uterus actually do? Well, the uterus is one of the most vital organs that play a significant role in the female reproductive system. It's actually pear-shaped, so it looks like a little pear, and it has a light bulk nearing towards the bottom. When you are not pregnant, the size of your womb, also known as your uterus, is almost the size of your fist, and it only weighs about one ounce. So a normal uterus size. A normal uterus has small volumes, okay, when you're not pregnant. It's about three inches vertically and two inches wide. The uterus is located in the pelvis and sits between the rectum and the urinary bladder. The various components provide support to your uterus, and that includes your pelvic floor muscles, your ligaments, and your perineal body. So I know this sounds like an anatomy class and I promise I don't mean it to, but you have to figure out what the womb is in order to understand what it does. So the womb, also known as the uterus, are parts of the uterus and these are these parts. Number one, you'll hear things called the cervix, right? This is the lowermost part of the uterus and it acts like a gate which dilates and allows your baby to actually pass through the vaginal delivery. Most people think that whenever they are being penetrated by a very large penis, that it's actually hitting the cervix. Well, your cervix can potentially bleed if it does end up getting hurt over and over again. But that thumping feeling is actually, it's hitting your uterus. So that's what that thump and then it comes back down and that thump again is. So again, ladies, I want you to understand that yes, your cervix is very strong unless you have an incontinent cervix. And for that, we actually do have a, a cervical cerclage, which has ended up being placed. That's a very big word for let's basically tie it up and make sure that the baby doesn't fall out prior to whenever you need to. And if you had a cervical cerclage um, on the first baby, by the way, you will probably have it on every other significant baby only because your cervix doesn't change. It just goes back to its normal um, thickness whenever you stop or ever when you deliver and give birth to the baby. 
All right, so we already talked about the cervix. Um, that's actually where the baby will actually pass through. It kind of looks, we, we call it like the one-eyed monster, right? So as you go up the vaginal canal, that's what you would actually see whenever your OBGYN or your GYN takes a look um, with the duck-billed platypus, right? With the actual speculum. And then with that speculum, that's what we're taking a look at. And if you've ever had it tested. Um, that's what they're doing. The scraping of the actual cervix. Now the body, this is also called the corpus. The body itself is that bigger part. Okay. The isthmus. Now this is the thin part of the uterus between the body and the corpus. So think of the corpus as the inside, right? And think of the isthmus as the thin part between the two. So it's kind of like, think of it like as your uterus is skin or a thick skin, if that makes you understand it or think of it a little better. I do have a drawing on this. Um, it's actually already on. If you go to nomonagia.com and you go into health and wellness blogs, you will actually see this blog post and you'll see an entire diagram of what the uterus looks like and its other parts. Now the fundus, this is the uppermost part of the uterus and it is the widest part. It connects the uterus to the fallopian tubes. So remember if we talked about it before, but the fallopian tubes are what are connected to your ovaries and the ovaries actually disperse or give off those eggs, right? They flow down through the fallopian tubes and that's again the part of the fundus and then from there we already know and we've already talked about the body also called the corpus and then if we were to go down lower that's when we would actually hit the cervix. So what is the endometrium or what is endometrial, right? It is the wall of the uterus that is divided into three different layers. The outermost layer offers protection to the uterus and is called the perimetrium. The middle layer, which is called the myometrium, consists of muscle, right? It's really thick in which it can actually expand and contract during labor to help push that baby out. The innermost layer of the uterus is called the endometrium. This layer lines the uterus and is shed during the menstrual cycle. So if you're ever wondering why is it that I can bleed for three to seven days, right, without dying, it's because you're actually shedding off that endometrium layer. So again, endometrium is the in innermost that gets sloughed off when you are not pregnant. The actual myometrium, myo is another word for muscle, that actually deals with a contraction. And that's also the reason why if you ever have pregnant, or excuse me, if you ever have um, your period prior to pregnancy and you get really bad cramps, that's that myometrium acting up again, all right? And then again, you have your perimetrium, which is up on the top. So what exactly is the function of the uterus? The uterus has three major functions in the reproductive health and or reproductive system. During pregnancy, the fertilized egg attaches to the uterine wall and allows your baby to grow. The uterus also stretches during pregnancy, providing adequate room for your baby to grow in nutrients. And I'm actually gonna pause and give you some a little advice. Um, if you're a person who has been trying to get pregnant and you have not been successful or undergoing IVF treatment, we actually do have a podcast that was dedicated to all of these natural ways or things to think about to help you to get pregnant. Okay. Um, so again, I really do want you to think about this. If you need attachment, Okay. Think of it like little hair-like follicles on the inside of the uterus. If you need an attachment, you don't want to take a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory, which means um, that's things like ibuprofen and Aleve because you want that like hair-like substance, right? To really grasp on. So I think it's very important that you know to try to take Tylenol instead of ibuprofen um, whenever you're getting aches and pains before you try to have a baby. These are things that a lot of times people are not telling you. So I created an entire podcast. It's episode 62, Why Am I Not Getting Pregnant? And just little things to think about um, whenever that time period comes, plus being able to give your, your uterus and your body the nutrients that it needs. So go check out that episode if you really want to. But again, most of you are probably already pregnant. So I'm kind of preaching to the choir here. 
Okay, once the fertilized egg actually attaches, the uterus also stretches during pregnancy, providing adequate room for your baby to go and grow. And with that growth period, if this is your first baby, you will feel your round ligament really start to give you a pain in your hip and in your pelvis. Yes, within the first trimester, that's what that pain is. Um, Your round ligament is actually what ends up attaching um, everything together and that can actually cause some pain, FYI, in stretching. So as your baby grows, your uterus grows as well. And in addition um, to not being pregnant, your uterus obviously plays a role in your menstrual cycle. But most of you guys don't have to worry about that. But just for whenever your period does come back, uh, when fertilization fails, so when you're not pregnant, after the egg is released, the inner lining of the uterus lofts off and releases in um, releases out of the body called the menses, which we all know is your flow, your ant flow, and all that other good stuff. But that's the one positive part, ladies, about being pregnant, right? You don't get your period. It's amazing. Um, and I will also let you know that even though your period will not come back and regulate itself immediately after Um, you give birth because again, most of you are going to be breastfeeding and things of that nature. Please remember that you can still get pregnant. (laughs) Um, So I want to throw that out there because I have a lot of patients that come to me and say, well, I thought if I was breastfeeding, I can't get pregnant. Not true. Um, So you still are shedding eggs and they could still be fertilized by your husband. All right. Your uterus also has a reflex. It's called the vasovagal. When it's tugged or pulled, and it's what's connected to the vagus nerve, which is a part of your parasympathetic system. So your parasympathetic system controls the relaxation part, right? Your heart rate may drop significantly and you might have, um, your heart rate might drop with intense contractions because it is pulling at that vagus nerve and or the pulling and tugging during the C-section, okay? A lot of times um, women will actually know exactly when their uterus is being picked up and manhandled um, during a C-section because the their first response is to get sick. So I don't want you to get sick. Um, please make sure that you go grab a nomonaja ban at any of the retail locations like Walmart or CVS or Bed Bath & Beyond or Meyer Drugstore, all those other places um, before you actually deliver. Most 175 different hospital systems will have nomonaja um, Med Plus bans for you pregnant women, but I can't guarantee in any, um, in any and all hospitals that you deliver in. So just again, 12 bucks could save you from vomiting all over your husband during your C-section. He is welcome on my behalf. All right. So this is um, usually the most common reason for 80% of women to experience nausea and vomiting during delivery. This is both for vaginally and for C-sections because of that tugging and the pulling of the uterus. And when you are delivering vaginally and you give a really good grunt, right, you are really making sure that you're intensely pushing that baby out, that can cause a vasovagal as well. Remember, a uh, placement of the spinal and, or excuse me, placement of the spinal and epidural um, and having an inadequate hydration prior to placement, basically you're just dehydrated and you don't have enough fluids, can also cause this immediate vomiting. So make sure that you talk to your anesthesia provider and make sure that it doesn't. But again, great news, you have natural relief um, for nausea and vomiting. So no more nausea ban is actually a three-in-one essential oil infused acupressure bracelet that instantly stops, um, that's designed for pregnancy and instantly stops nausea and vomiting in 30 seconds or less. So it is used by hospitals. It's found in a bunch of different retailers. And trust me, you will want it to make sure that you don't give up your cookies because even when you're delivering vaginally, you haven't probably had a big meal in a while. So they won't feed you, FYI. Alrighty, so how does the pregnant uterus change? The uterus undergoes a lot of changes when you're pregnant. The muscular layer of the uterus increases, also known as hypertrophy. It is growth, the kind of growth that you get when you work out, right? Your muscles get bigger. This leads to an overall increase in the uterus about 35 by 25 by 22 centimeters. Didn't we say before that it starts out as like a three by two? 
Yep, that means that your body has changed significantly, like 10 times its size, right? So I don't know about you, but nothing else grows 10 times its size or else you you hope not. <laughs> um, but that is something that does. So your uterus is really to be looked upon um, as an amazing entity that's really able to grow and stretch. And it grows within that abdominal cavity. The uterus, actually the weight of the uterus increases 20 times from about 50 grams to about a thousand grams. And the total capacity of the uterus also increases a thousand fold from 400 mLs to 4,000 mLs, which that's basically like You can have almost four liters of blood in there. That's insane. But your body naturally understands that it's going to be increasing the amount of of blood because you're going to be having, you know, you're going to be delivering a baby. So it usually increases the blood volume about 50 to five, excuse me, it, it doubles or excuse me, your blood volume to about 500 mLs to about a liter extra. And it does this in order to protect you. So if you're ever sitting there and you're curious and saying, why am I so darn stuffed up? Well, it's easy. It's because your body knows that you're going to be losing this blood. So it needs to produce more blood flow, but then this can also cause you to feel like that sense of congestion because you just have a lot more fluid in there. All right. So this makes sure and ensues that your body and your baby are growing in the proportionate amount. Now, what causes an enlarged uterus? You guessed it, pregnancy. So during pregnancy, the shape of your uterus also changes. It becomes very globular by the eighth week of pregnancy and pitoriform from the 16th week to term. Pregnant moms that have an enlarged uterus are changing the size with their baby. Thinking of their uterus as like a hot tub, it protects the baby. So if you don't have too much amniotic fluid um, because of an enlarged uterus, this too much amniotic fluid will cause an even bigger uterus. A lot less amniotic fluid will be a smaller uterus. So that's also the reason why they chart your uterine growth, um, you know, from the actual pelvic bone, and then they chart it to the top of the uterus. So it should be growing and changing appropriately. If it's not, it can signal that the baby is in distress. Um, It can signal IUGR, interuterine growth retardation, meaning that the baby is not growing appropriately. And or if it's measuring too big or too much, especially with an ultrasound, the fluid, you could be seeing a reason for having too much amniotic fluid. And that can be for a few reasons. Um, one, it could be because the mom, the, the baby, excuse, the mom and the baby um, are having gestational diabetes. So again, there's there's a lot more fluid that is going through. Or the baby has trouble basically moving the fluid through. Um, that's where the baby gets all the nutrients. So think of it like they literally swallow it and then they poop it back out, and they kind of do it all over again. So it is a a completely clean cycle within the body. But I'm only making mention of this because babies can have um, problems with their intestines and not being in the right place at the right time can also signal a trouble um, if the total size of the uterus um, is not where it's supposed to be because of the fluid. So the medical definition of um, polyhydramnios is where there's too much amniotic fluid. These reasons for polyhydramnios is things like having multiples, like twins and triplets. Let's try that again. And gestational diabetes because the babies will be larger. And a blockage in the baby's gut, like we talked about before, this is called gut atresia. Um, Pregnant women with polyhydramnios may experience premature contractions, longer labor, difficulties in breathing, and so much more. So we just want to make sure that you babies and moms are well taken care of. Now let's look at the positions of the uterus, and then I can tell you what kind of uterus that you have. The uterus is that are antiverted. Most women have an antiverted uterus. The uterus is slightly tilted towards the cervix, pointing towards the belly. However, some women have their uterus in different position. That includes a retroverted uterus, by which the uterus tilts backwards, antiflex uterus, in which the uterus curves forward to the extent that it puts more pressure on your abdomen and bladder causing pain, and then a retroflexed uterus is the uterus that bends more towards the back, causing pressure on your lower back. So um, if you had, or excuse me, if you have a uterus that is 
different than most, which is an antiverted uterus, you will experience labor in very various different ways. Okay. Um, so I had that back pain and also my, I actually, my uterus was in front. Um, so I was not a candidate for aversion. And so again, aversion is when you know that you're getting a C-section and you want, um, the baby to end up flipping Unfortunately, I was not a candidate for that, but you may be, um, and or you may be a person or a mommy who has had a C-section in the past and is looking for a a different way, right? You want to try it naturally if that's the case. Um, and I don't mean naturally as in no medication. I mean naturally as in to go through the vagina Um, the way that it was kind of intended. But if you are one of those women, um, there is hope, right? You can find OBGYNs that are comfortable performing a VBAC. And a VBAC is a vaginal birth after a cesarean section. And if you're curious as to what is that, how can I actually, um, you know, how can this happen and what do I need to do for it? You can always go and search or you can always go take a look at our other um you can take a look at our other podcast and it's episode 21. It's called What is a VBAC, right? It's everything that you need to know about what a VBAC is. So I know that was a lot of medical definitions. I am usually not that person. I'm usually much more with the humor side. So let's get to some really funny puking pregnancy stories because we all have them. Let's be real. We've all gone through that first trimester morning sickness. Coming up right now. Growing up on a Tuesday? One puke story. Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah. Uh. The worst was barfing in a bathroom of an airport as the automatic toilet continuously flushes in my face. And I'm peeing my pants with the force of heaving. My bag was already checked through, so I had no clean pants for the next six hours. Oh my goodness, that is a hilarious puke story. I can only envision just the automatic flush every time that your head goes, you know, down inside the toilet. Oh, sweetie, that's terrible. Thank you for your puke story, though, that uh, made me get a little few giggles out of it. I got really good at throwing up into plastic baggies while driving, but once it happened while I was driving seven miles an hour down a freeway and it got all over me in the car. Anaya from Washington. Oh my gosh, that was terrible. Let me guess, you rolled down the window and you tried to puke inside. (laughs) Um, If you did that, girl, we've all been there. It was not while I was pregnant though, um, but mine was going down Tamiami Trail down in Miami. You know what? I just thought I could put my head out the window and that does not happen. If you're driving 70 miles an hour, it's kind of like a brick wall. And when you puke, it comes right back on your face. All right. Number three, I thought I was over the sickness part and I was, you know, getting frisky with my hubby. I don't want to be graphic, but let's just say that we found out the hard way that pregnancy gives me a really strong gag reflex. It was so bad. So very, very bad that even after delivering my dentist can't even touch my mouth without me going, Thanks for that. And thanks, Amanda, for that hilarious puke story. Now, do you have a funny puke story in pregnancy that you just can't wait to share with me? Please send it to me. Pukeology, P-U-K-E-O-L-O-G-Y at nomonausea.com or tweet me at Pukeology so we can all have a good laugh. (laughs) Tips and tricks to stop the up chuckle that you need. So getting pregnant with a retroverted uterus, okay? So having a retroverted uterus does not affect your ability to conceive. I want to make sure that I put that out in big, bold letters. Most of you guys are already pregnant, but for some who are like really freaking out about the type of um, any type other than anterograde uterus that you have, 
Again, I want to make sure that you understand that you can still conceive and you can still have a baby. However, your ability to conceive may be affected if the retroverted uterus is caused by other conditions, things like a fibroid, a uterine fibroid, endometriosis, or pelvic inflammatory disease. In addition, retroverted pregnancy does not affect the ability of your, or the viability, excuse me, of your baby. So your baby is okay as long as it's inside the uterus, but you may experience some urinary incontinence incontinence or difficult passing urine and low back pain because getting pregnant with the retroverted uterus exerts pressure on your bladder and on your low back. Now, ladies who are in their third trimester and who haven't had these problems the entire time, you probably don't have a retroverted uterus. Um, So I want to make sure that you understand that, but I do have to make caution and warning that if you constantly had this issue, you might have had a uterus that was slightly tilted to the back. A lean back, a lean back, right? A lean back type of uterus. All right, pregnancy with a bicornate uterus. This refers to an irregularly shaped uterus and is shaped like a heart instead of a pear. As such, a bicornate uterus does not have one hollow cavity. Usually, the uppermost part of the uterus is separated by tissue. Women who become pregnant and have a bicornate uterus have a higher risk of having a miscarriage and preterm labor. So again, remember that it kind of does the separation and you need that whole amount um, to be able to really grow at an adequate area so that the baby doesn't kind of get stuck, right? Uh, two different uteruses. Now, this is probably my most interesting. Um, I have to say I've never delivered a baby. I've never even had a patient that has had two uteruses, but they do exist. They do exist. So two uteruses during pregnancy, a double uterus is medically called a uterine diphelis, which is abnormal and very, very, very rare. Having two uteruses is a rare congenital, meaning it's a gene uh, from your parents. So say thanks if you have it abnormally. And it's usually when the mom was a fetus, the uterus started growing out of two small tubes that usually join together to become one large uterus. Sometimes the tubes don't fully join completely, and that's what causes a two uterus a two uterus pregnancy. Okay. So again, when your mom was pregnant, and if you have two uteruses, the two tubes that usually form together to form one major uterus never do that. So the two tubes end up forming two separate entities and that's when they make the two uteruses. In 2011, a woman in my home state of Florida gave birth to two babies, one in each uterus. The chances were one in five million. So that mama needs to go and play the lottery ASAP. Other two uterine births include one mommy having three babies a month apart. Isn't that insane? So two babies were actually inside of one uterus and one baby was in the other. And they literally are of different birthing. I mean, each uterus has its own time in which it gives the baby, you know, their their eviction notice. And so it's a very interesting story. I've never been able to say that I have had patients like that. But again, your pregnancy doc has always got some time to learn even more. Now, pregnancy outside of the uterus. So any pregnancy that occurs outside of the uterus is referred to as an ectopic pregnancy. Therefore, a fertilized egg implants and develops outside the uterus. Most ectopic pregnancies occur in the oviduct, but they can also happen in the uter- uh, excuse me, in the ovary and in the abdominal cavity. Most ectopic pregnancies um, cannot grow to term, and they usually will end up if it's if it grows inside of the fallopian tube. Unfortunately, it can potentially have. Um, you have to have emergency surgery and you might lose that entire fallopian tube. Now, I'm not trying to scare you. Um, There's so many other things that could potentially happen, um, but this is actually considered an ectopic pregnancy. I I know this is... um, This is like a term that a lot of people are very interested in. Um, Ectopic pregnancies do happen. Go listen to my podcast, uh, episode 23. It's called Ectopic Pregnancies. What causes them, what happens to them, and what to expect. Again, in providing anesthesia, you know, we do have to... um, put this patient off to sleep because the baby unfortunately will not be able to survive in that area. Alrighty, so go listen to it. It's really interesting and it kind of gives you a better indication or idea as to what could potentially happen. So a lot of things have to go in the right way in order for you to be 
perfectly pregnant and that's what you ladies are. All right, so how does the pregnant uterus change? So I'm gonna summarize everything that we kind of talked about right now. The uterus plays a key role in the reproductive health. It is where the fertilized egg implants, attaches itself to the uterus and grows into a beautiful baby. The uterus is also involved in the menstrual cycle when you are not pregnant, sloughing off the innermost um, endometrium layer. Most women have an antiverted uterus while some have a tilted uterus. However, the tilted uterus does not affect a woman's ability to conceive unless associated with other conditions like fibroids. A bicornate uterus happens when the uterus fails to form a hollow cavity completely and is associated with an increased risk of preterm labor and or miscarriage. So pregnancy outside of the uterus refers to an ectopic pregnancy and which mostly occurs in the fallopian tubes and emergency surgery is necessary because the baby just cannot grow in the area in which it is stuck there. But again, I hope you ladies really understand that how incredible our uteruses really are, how they grow a thousand fold, how they fill themselves up um, to, to really help house the baby. And again, it is super incredible to watch, um, not just from a vaginal perspective, but also even from a C-section to really see that incredible muscle group usually being utilized. Remember that Pitocin is hung, uh, not just previously prior to delivery, but also afterwards to really make sure that we get all of that blood squeezed out um, and, and everything squeezed out of the uterus so that you will have a wonderful fourth labor. Um, and the fourth later is, is the delivery of the placenta and really getting everything back to normal. Now you guys have learned all about the uterus. You've learned about what kind of uterus you have, how does it function, what to expect during pregnancy, and all of these changes in your trimester. I hope that you've absolutely loved it and given, um, give me some hearts, right? Give me some likes. So Pregnancy Pegology Podcast, let me know that you love me and everything that I have to offer with pregnancy with five-star ratings or hearts for likes. Don't forget to download this episode, but more importantly, share it with all your Prego friends. Thanks again for listening to Pregnancy Pecology Podcast, episode 84. How does your uterus change? See you ladies next week. Pugology Podcast, edutainment at its finest.